Well, as I mentioned at the outset of the video, I was recording with a brand new camera and it decided to stop recording after about a half hour. And so I will have to finish out the lesson in this way here, more personal, face to face. And so we will get through chapter 27 of Job. Unfortunately, we didn't make it into chapter 28. That'll be a, a lesson for another week. So we'll get through chapter 27 and then call it a day. All right. So we will start by reading verses 1 through 6. And Job continued his discourse, As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made me taste bitterness of soul, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, and my tongue will utter no deceit. I will never admit you are in the right. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. All right, so here we see Job not agreeing to what his friends say. Once again, he maintains his righteousness before God. He will never admit that he has done something wicked or done some secret sin in order to deserve this suffering because it's just not true and he knows it's not true. And he's been trying to convince his friends that they're operating under uh, false assumptions and bad theology. And he, he will maintain his point. Uh, and uh, so he keeps his integrity throughout the book, uh, despite their insistence. And so this really helps us understand the main theme of the book. It's not, as many people think, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, because as we've seen, how do we know who, what is good for us or what isn't good for us? Also, as we've seen, how do we know who is good and who isn't good? By outside appearances, Job might appear to be sinful to his friends. By outside appearances, his friends might appear to be good people, righteous people. Uh, however, we know that neither of those is true. Job, in fact, is righteous by faith, declared so by God himself at the beginning and end of the book. And it's Job's friends who need uh, repentance and forgiveness, who themselves are not righteous, as we find out at the end of the book. Uh, and so Job uses a very powerful um, kind of oath here, as God lives. We see that used throughout Scripture. God uses that of himself as well. He'll sometimes say, as surely as I live, as I am real and exist, I am existence. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, Job indicates uh, sort of a, a, a misplaced faith or a, uh, a wrong faith, right? Because he also says, God has denied me justice, which we also know is not what's going on, is not the case. Yet, even in thinking that God is actively denying him justice, is being unfair to him, yet he still maintains his faith, his hope, his trust in God. God is the only one who can deliver him and vindicate him no matter what happens. It reflects something Job said earlier in chapter 13, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. So no matter what God brings to us, allows to happen to us, our trust will remain in him. And this accurately reflects the theme of the book. It's not why do bad things happen to good people, but why are the righteous faithful despite their suffering? So it's not even necessarily about why do the righteous suffer, because Job, as far as we know, never finds out why he suffered all these things. Yet, uh, by the Spirit of God, he is faithful. His faith trembles and wavers, and he starts to rethink some things and get them wrong. But his faith never fails. And that's the important theme of the book. Why are those God has declared to be righteous, faithful, and remain true to God's word, even in the midst of the suffering God allows to happen to them? Um, notice here another difference, another sort of misplaced faith that Job is slipping into. Previously, he had maintained his righteousness because he had an advocate before the throne of God. He had a mediator, right, a go-between, someone who was true God and truly righteous and also true human, who was his go-between. This is the Messiah. This is Jesus Christ, 
right? Now, however, he says, I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. I will maintain my righteousness. Job is so latched on to this idea that he is truly righteous, declared to be righteous by faith, that he's putting his faith in his faith. Uh, basically, he's putting his trust in his own ability to be righteous. And this needs correction as well. This also is a false idea. So in the chapters ahead, when the new friend comes in, the fourth friend, Elihu, he will rightfully criticize Job for this uh, misplaced faith, right? It's not your righteousness that makes you righteous. That's work righteousness, right? That's putting trust in your own works of righteousness. Rather, it is God who declares you righteous for Christ's sake, for the sake of Jesus' righteousness. Once again, we have a, a very subtle but good reflection of Job being justified by faith alone. Not by his works, but by faith. And that faith is not a good work that he has to do, right? Um, this... Uh, also, as we move into here, he's uh, maintaining his own righteousness, which he will do throughout the book. And then this leads him uh, into very important context for the upcoming verses, the rest of this chapter. Um, he's going to talk about the fate of the wicked. And we can compare this and contrast this to Job's friends. Job's friends have also made claims about what will happen to the wicked. Um, as opposed to the righteous. And it's important for this to be set up here in the next verses, verses 7 through 10. So we will read these important verses. May my enemies be like the wicked, my adversaries like the unjust. For what hope has the godless when he is cut off, when God takes away his life? When Does God listen to his cry when distress comes upon him? Will he find delight in the Almighty? Will he call upon God at all times? Okay, so Job is basically saying he's not making excuses for the wicked. He's saying there is a, a judgment, a justice that will await them from God. However, this is what's the important context. Because once we get into verses 11 through the end of the chapter, Job is going to say some things that sound very similar to what his friends were saying. And if we don't understand what he's talking about, we might think he's suddenly agreeing with his friends out of nowhere, that the wicked get what's coming to them always in this life. Um, that what goes around always comes around. Um, and so we need to understand, first off, Job is saying, look, I'm not wicked, and by claiming I'm righteous, I'm not making excuses for wickedness. Um, but also, this is the final judgment, right? Does, what hope has the godless when he is cut off, when God takes away his life? This is death and afterwards. So that is the important context we need to understand in order to interpret Job's words correctly. He's talking about final judgment the death of the wicked and what happens after that. He's not saying these are bad things that will happen in the life, within the lifetime of the wicked person so that they always get what we think should be coming to them. Right? Previously, he's denied that. He said God will even elevate the wicked, you know, and, and give them a time uh, of prosperity where they don't get what's coming to them. However, in the end, reckoning, right, when death comes, that is the final, that's the judgment, right, of the soul. And there is the final judgment in eternity. And that is what Job is talking about here. There's going to be some uh, strange translations, too. I have the old NIV from 84. I don't have the new NIV in front of me, so I don't know if they've changed it or not. But my translation here in the old NIV does some, some funny things that also are sort of misleading from what Job is actually saying. Uh, but we'll talk about that in this next section as well. Verses 11 through 23, through the end of the chapter. Uh, I will teach you about the power of God. The ways of the Almighty I will not conceal. You have all seen this yourselves, 
Why then this meaningless talk? Here is the fate God allots to the wicked, the heritage a ruthless man receives from the Almighty. Once again, we have to understand when Job talks about the fate the wicked receives from God, it's all in the context of when he is cut off, right? When God takes away his life from verse 8. This is the final fate, the final judgment. Uh, Verse 14, however many his children, their fate is the sword. His offspring will never have enough to eat. And we're going to put a pin in that translation right there because it sounds like he's agreeing with his friends that in this life, though children of the wicked always will never get enough food. They'll always go hungry. That's not what he's saying. Verse 15, the plague will bury those who survive him and their widows will not weep for them. I'm going to put a pin in that one too because it sounds like something very specific Uh, The plague, pestilence, sickness, disease will always be the end of the children of the wicked. Once again, not the direction Job is going with that. Verse 16, though he heaps up silver like dust and clothes like piles of clay, what he lays up, the righteous will wear, and the innocent will divide his silver. The house he builds is like a moth's cocoon, like a hut made by a watchman. That's a, a, a temporary hut that someone would put up out in the field just for uh, a night, just to be temporary, to watch over the fields. Um, Very easily dismantled and torn down. He lies down wealthy, but will do so no more. When he opens his eyes, all is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A tempest snatches him away in the night. The east wind carries him off and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. Uh, Once again, this is talking about the final judgment that comes upon us. It comes uh, very suddenly, right? We we don't always have time that we think we might have to prepare for it. And death will always come unexpectedly to those who are not prepared for it. If you're not prepared today to die and meet your maker, you will never be prepared uh, because you're putting it off, right? The final preparation. And as long as you put it off, as long as you think, I can do that when I'm old, I can do that next week, I can do that tomorrow, um, you'll never be prepared because you'll always think tomorrow will come and it's never promised or guaranteed to any of us. So thankfully, we have the this, this assurance that all of our sins are forgiven by Christ, that any time we die is a good time to die. <laughs> who die the, the hymn says, who dies in faith dies well. That's the blessed death is dying with faith. Uh, saving faith in Christ. A Christian, whether they feel like it or not, is always ready to die uh, because Christ has done everything to prepare them. Um, And they are always ready to die because death uh, is not defeat. It is only victory. It can only bless and benefit you. You can only benefit from dying, however it comes to you, whenever it comes. It'll just put you right into heaven, and that's wonderful. The east wind carries him off and he is gone. This is referenced elsewhere in scripture. Psalm 103, my favorite psalm, personal favorite psalm, uh, in verses 14 through 17 talks about the nature of humanity. The fate of man is um, uh, is like uh, dust, like the flowers of the field that withers and its place is remembered no more when God breathes upon them. It's like the hot east wind blowing off the desert that withers the living thing and it blows away and it is no more. It hurls itself against him without mercy as he flees headlong from its power. This is an image of the wicked facing death, right? And once again, that thought, I don't have to think about death. I can postpone it. I can put it off till I'm in my old age and dying peacefully. That's not guaranteed to anybody, right? So even though death hurls itself against us without mercy, we try to flee from it, it, we can't run from it. It claps its hands in derision and hisses him out of place. He's just gone. This, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, 
a fan of uh, film and I'm, you know, I was, I'm a fan of comic books from when I was a kid. And so this immediately also, in addition to the scriptural references, made me think of that um, a horrifying image from Avengers Endgame. Uh, oh, here we have vanity. All is vanity. We'll come back to that. Of the wind blowing over them and the, we are but dust. And uh, it hisses him out of his place. This is spoilers, by the way, for Avengers uh, Infinity War and Endgame. It's a good reminder of death, though, uh, when your favorite superheroes all vanish into dust. Uh, we all must die, right? That's the fate we all face. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Um, I, and so I absolutely love that moment in Infinity War because it's specifically horrifying and horrible. It's a reminder of death. And then the what, what eventually happens in Endgame, Thanos' death himself is dead, destroyed, right? And we have gained back everything that was lost. It's beautiful, uh, wonderful. You have, uh, you have the work of Christ showing up in storytelling, right? And uh, maybe, you know, without intending it, the work of Christ, Christian themes and motifs appear despite people's uh, <laughs> intentions. It's, it's beautiful, the beauty of the gospel. We're going to go back to this. This is a uh, painting or image called uh, All is Vanity, a reference to the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Um, that vanity, the word vanity, is uh, from the Hebrew that means meaningless, worthless. All is, so you'll sometimes hear it translated, wor or meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Um, vanity, this little thing here that she's looking at has a big mirror, you know, and there's like your, your makeup and everything where you get ready, you do your hair, and it was, it's called a vanity, right, because you sit in front of the mirror. It's um, a vanity for two reasons, because you can become incre incredibly vain, by which we mean like narcissistic, full of yourself. You fall in love with your reflection, that's narcissistic. Uh, and it's also vain, it's meaningless, pointless, worthless, right? A good reminder for us, um, especially when we have like, you know, these <laughs> vain little mirrors that we just record and, and think the world of. And it's uh, both narcissistic and completely meaningless too. Uh, okay, back to, back, back to death, uh, <laughs> as always. Um, everything that we accumulate, uh, will vanish. This is where this chapter, chapter 28, the next chapter, has a lot of connections to the book of Proverbs. Chapter 27 here has a lot of connections to the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, this is, the, what Job is saying here is really reflected in Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 2. To, where do I have that reference? Here it is. Ch Ecclesiastes chapter 2, there's a whole section of this, verses 18 and 19 in particular. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless, vanity. This is what Job is saying. Though he, though the wicked man heaps up silver like dust and clothes like piles of clay, they will be left to someone else. And Job is making the point the righteous will inherit them, will wear them. The innocent will divide his silver. And Ecclesiastes takes that point even further. Um, well, Jesus says, first of all, the, the meek shall inherit the earth, right? Uh, but Ecclesiastes makes that point even further by saying, um, God, you know, God will divide up the blessings and give it, give them to those he loves, but also uh, God will allow those, uh, everything we've worked for in this life to fall into the hands of fools, right? It might fall into the hands of a wise person who's appreciated the work and effort we go to, but it might fall into the hands of complete fools who will waste it and use it greedily. And in fact, the bigger the amount that we've worked for, the more money there is involved, the more stuff, the bigger the inheritance, the more fools will be clamoring to take a piece of it, right? Uh, the greed within our hearts really turns up when someone very rich and influential and that has a lot of stuff dies. Their inheritance, you know, 
People come out of the woodworks to try to claim their piece of it. Um, however, the east wind carries him off and he is gone. I wanted to return to verse 14 and 15 very quickly, just to say, point out maybe where we could fall into a misunderstanding of this. Um, however many his children, their fate is the sword. That's just destruction, death, cutting them off. His offspring will never have enough to eat. That's the translation I have. I don't like that translation because the Hebrew originally says his offspring will never be satisfied with bread. Now, never having enough to eat is very, very different than never being satisfied with what you have, right? In one way, you are starving. You can't get enough to eat. That's not what's being said here. What is being said here is the wicked, the children of the wicked, will never be satisfied with their daily bread, with the, the food that they have, right? And that is true, absolutely, that if someone is wicked and just wants to pile stuff up and, and uh, hoard things for themselves, if they're greedy, um, their children will follow as an example. That's, that's the example they have. Their children will never be satisfied. They will always be looking for more and thinking they deserve more and more and more, and they will be unhappy. They will receive everything they need for their body and life and soul. Every day of their life, God will give it to them out of his grace, gracious providence, his care, and they will never be happy with it. They'll never be content. And that's why wisdom, we'll see in the next chapter 28, why wisdom is more precious than gold. Because you cannot buy contentment. You cannot buy wisdom and appreciation and gratitude. Um, you can have all the gold in the world and still want more, 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 and never be satisfied. And satisfaction is something you can't purchase. Um, I can't get no satisfaction, as the modern-day sages have said. Also in the next chapter, verse 15, the plague will bury those who survive him. Um, the word that's used for plague here can sometimes be plague, pestilence, but in sort of the overall general sense of destruction. Um, and the, the way that it's written in Hebrew is uh, in, in death he shall be buried. So it, it sort of, the translation before me sort of sounds like a, a plague, pestilence, some sort of disease will come upon them, guaranteed. That's not really what's being said here. It's more that in death, generally, destruction, they will be buried, which is true, yeah. Even, you know, the wicked man must die, and then his next generation must die, and the generation after that must die. And that's what awaits all of us. In death, we all will be buried, right? Um, and Job is making the point that the wicked have no comfort because they had their comfort in life. And now it's done. It's gone. And they knew it was coming, and they didn't prepare for it. And so that's the difference, the big difference between the righteous by faith and the wicked is... The righteous by faith are prepared for death, whether they feel prepared or not. Jesus has prepared them with faith through the means of grace, the word and sacraments. Okay, I think we will leave it there for today. To next week, we're going to get through chapter 28. I still haven't decided if we're going to move on after chapter 28. We're getting a bit short on time here at the near the end of the book. Um, but... Uh, I'm not really a big fan of, like, which I've sort of been doing lately. I'm not a big fan of breezing through things just to get through them. Um, I'd rather we have a good understanding of whatever we, is before us. And so I, I think we might just do chapter 28 next Sunday. I hope you will be back to join us then. Until then, God's grace and peace and everlasting life be with you uh, until we meet again.